Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for tuning into this episode of Just Another Tinfoil Hat, copyrighted on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm your host, Zelia Edgar. The aim of this show is to discuss all aspects of the paranormal, from the relatively mainstream to the downright bizarre, to pose questions and entertain ideas regarding every angle of the unexplained. So hang on to your tinfoil hats, keep your hands and feet inside the saucer, and please, enjoy the ride. Tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce my guests, Chad Lewis and Kevin Lee Nelson. For over two decades, Chad Lewis has traveled the back roads of the world in search of the strange and unusual, from tracking vampires in Transylvania and searching for the elusive monster of Loch Ness to trailing... What matters when you start a business is you and your idea, not when you start it. So if you make up your mind and go for it, GoDaddy has all the help and tools you need to bring it online. Start today at GoDaddy.com, because open, we stand. The dangerous Tata Duende to remote villages of Belize and searching for ghosts in Ireland's castles. Chad has scoured the earth in search of the paranormal. Chad has been featured on the Discovery Channel's A Haunting, William Shatner's Weird or What, ABC's World's Scariest Places, Monsters and Mysteries in America, along with being a frequent contributor to Ripley's Believe It or Not Radio. With a master's degree in psychology, Chad has authored 25 books on the supernatural and extensively lectures on his fascinating findings. The more bizarre the legend is, the more likely you will find Chad there. And unconventional is the best way to describe Kevin Lee Nelson's theories and research methodology. As an artist and student of Western esotericism and American folk magic traditions, Kevin provides a unique perspective, enabling him to uncover and decipher symbolic information, often hidden within unexplained phenomena. His fascination with sacred geometry and mystical architecture led him to a degree in drafting and design technology. Kevin has investigated hauntings on ABC's Scariest Places on Earth, searched for werewolves on Discovery Channel's Mystery Hunters, and tracked vampirism in America on Discovery Channel's Travelers. He has professionally lectured at paranormal conferences for nearly two decades, and is a contributing author to a number of books and articles on regional folklore. Kevin's personal mission is to seek out, record, and preserve our rich heritage of urban legends and modern folklore. This is further illustrated by Kevin's personal library, one of the largest collections of rare books on folklore, the occult, and parapsychology in the Upper Midwest. So, without further ado, Kevin and Chad, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Greetings Glad from the Northwood. <laughs> so, you know, I have to say, I mean, Chad, I know I've had you on the show once before. Um, Kevin, you know, welcome here for your first time. Very excited to have you both on the show today. Um, oh, and sure, now a super loud car is going by. So There goes Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> all right so but seriously i am so excited to have you guys here today so the two remaining members of backroads lore crew i don't know what happened to noah but <laughs> yeah that was a tragic sea serpent accident last i heard oh man another one lost to the waves <laughs> but eh, i suppose at least you guys are here and in one piece i suppose right most of the time most of the time? Okay. Okay. Just reanimated a little bit. All right. Well, that's totally fine. But today, um, we're really going to be discussing your fantastic new book, Wendigo Lore, Monsters, Myths, and Madness. So I, you know, I have to say, I read the book and it is just, it's seriously fantastic. And, you know, there are so many, it's a long book too. I mean, there's so much to cover here um, that we're definitely not going to be able to get to all of it today which is why people should definitely go out and actually get the book or stay in and get the book, I suppose I should say, given uh, the current circumstances. But anyway, one of the first things that I really noticed is something that I've actually noticed just in my research. And that's that you guys mentioned that most researchers just come at the Wendigo from either the standpoint of psychology or mythology and only that. And, you know, not only was your book really a much needed focus on the supernatural beliefs regarding this phenomena, but it also was a very holistic look at the entirety of the phenomena. And it was just, you know, it just blew my mind how much you guys really covered with that. So, you know, what do you think is the importance of really looking at these three aspects, not in a divergent way, but in more of a cohesive way? Well, I think Chad and I both approached this book uh, early on 
you know, kind of wondering how how we should deal with such a complicated subject. I mean, not not only is is the legend uh, large in geographically. I mean, it spans the entire North American continent practically, but it also goes back almost four hundred years, and you know that we know of, and who knows how long further back into Native American and First Nation lore. So, you know, we were trying to come up with a, a cohesive way to address the legend in its entirety. But yet, like you said, focus a lot on the folkloric and uh, supernatural side of the legends, because everything that's been written to date has been focusing very narrowly on and kind of more academic books. And even then, only a handful, uh, mostly focusing on the psychology behind it or from an, an anthropological standpoint, but completely ignoring any any of the supernatural or magical or mystical sides of the legend, which is a very large portion of it. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like, too, each of these three aspects, you know, kind of depends on the other aspect when you really um, look at it from that angle. Um, would you say that's kind of a fair estimation of it? Yeah. I mean, it's it's such a complex issue that, you know, we, we worked on it for almost a decade, probably well, actually a little bit more than a decade. And we went back and forth on how to structure the book. You know, what what should we put emphasis on? You know, should we narrow down our approach? You know, maybe cover just a, a portion of the legend, you know, that hasn't been covered yet. But we went back and forth and had a few false starts over the years and, you know, kind of even wondered if we were the right people to tackle such a, a story or a legend. But eventually we... we realized that it had to be done. And we, Chad and I both being from the upper Midwest, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Great Lakes area, which is, of course, part of the the region that the Wendigo is known to inhabit. You know, the more we thought about it, the, the more we realized that, you know, who better to do this book, really? And so we kind of structured the book in a way that focuses on the spiritual, supernatural side of the legend but also, like you said, you know, addresses other aspects, too, so that you get the full picture. Oh, yeah. And you definitely, you know, you definitely get that. And I feel like by only focusing on one angle and ignoring the other two, you know, people really are missing out on the entire scope of this legend, which is, as you mentioned, this sprawling, you know, complex belief system around one type of entity. Um, and, you know, it was interesting, too, because, again, I can't remember the first time I ever heard of the Wendigo. I think it may have actually been um, in a Linda Godfrey book. And, you know, when I looked it up then, exclusively, all I got was stuff on Wendigo psychosis. And, you know, I know that you guys discussed that in great detail in the book and kind of pointed out some of the inherent flaws with that um, theory. Yeah, we certainly did. And I think you're correct that most people that hear of the Wendigo, even if they just have a brief knowledge of it probably have come across Wendigo, Wendigo psychosis, which is the thought that people who believed in the Wendigo or believed they were turning Wendigo, it wasn't really happening. It was simply a mental illness that caused them to believe that they were becoming this flesh eating monster uh, and usually manifested in symptoms of depression, violence, desire for human flesh. That Researchers just threw it out that obviously that's the explanation because these things couldn't be real. And even though, as we mentioned earlier, we really wanted to focus on the supernatural aspect, the things everyone else has glossed over, we had to do a chapter on Wendigo psychosis because it is so well known and many people believe that's the explanation for the Wendigo. So I thought it uh, it was very important that we put a chapter of it in. And I think we we tried very hard to promote Wendigo psychosis as it has been thrown out there by all kinds of researchers, but not get too deep in the weeds on it. That if people want more information, they obviously can go and a lot of scholarly journals and academic papers focus on that. But we wanted a nice overview of the legend without bogging it down. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, too, because, you know, people do tend to look at that kind of as the explanation for the entire legend. When if you really look into the lore, as you guys have done, 
it ends up being more part of the legend that people are affected, you know, in, if you go by the folklore, in almost a possession type way. And, you know, that that would cause this, what is now perceived as psychosis. With that being said, what are some other really common misconceptions currently about the Wendigo? Because I do feel like it is hitting the public consciousness a little bit more recently. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. It, it seems to be popping up more and more in pop culture, in references, uh, you know, even just, you know, news feeds. If, if you follow you know, a lot of paranormal websites or blogs, things like that, it just seems to be cropping up a lot more than it ever used to. And one of the other things that we address in the book is uh, not only do we get to the roots of the legend, you know, going all the way back to Korean Ojibwe beliefs, but we also talk about where the legend sits today, which again, is another thing that academics don't focus on at all. Um, and, you know, if you, right now, if you Google Wendigo and hit images, you're going to see a creature that has sort of like an elk skull head with antlers and looks really creepy. And really, that's not traditional at all for what a Wendigo looked like if you if you go all the way back to the actual accounts and oral uh legends of the creature so part of the book is you know we, we wanted to figure out you know well where did this come from where did this imagery originate and we do our best to try to figure that out and we, we have a pretty good idea of about when it did which looks like about the 1930s and 40s uh a lot of pe- artists and things in in some of the old pulp magazines were taking some creative license with the creature and the story because to be honest, a lot of people, they heard the term Wendigo, but they really didn't understand what the legend was really about. It was basically this, this North woods boogeyman, but you know, that's about the extent that they knew. And so a lot of people gave it all kinds of different characteristics and, and colored in a different way. And for whatever reason, the, the antlers thing just kind of stuck. You know, people started viewing the Wendigo as this, this Northwoods uh, elemental kind of creature or a creature, or a creature of the wintertime and starvation. And, and this skull-faced entity that people were starting to create kind of represented that, uh, that figure of famine and, uh, and the harshness of winter, things like that. So it was, it's more of a symbolic representation than, than anything that really has any accuracy to the original lore. Definitely noticed that, you know, throughout um, just looking up the Wendigo, it is almost exclusively, yeah, kind of this like zombie deer man um, sort of thing. And, you know, I was wondering, because I am, I'm very interested in, you know, kind of the back and forth of the effect of beliefs on paranormal phenomena and the paranormal phenomena back upon um, beliefs. Have you guys been seeing, you know, people believing that they are spotting this current pop culture representation of the Wendigo? Has that been kind of cropping up at all or not so much? Certainly. I have a a case of a gentleman who was out hunting in the woods and he was out uh, hunting and he shot a deer and was tracking it. And as he was tracking it, he heard his name being called. And it sounded familiar to him as though somebody he knew was calling his name. And he looked around and nothing was there and couldn't find the deer. Eventually left the woods, uh, went over to his buddy that he was hunting with and said, were you calling out my name? I heard someone calling. It sounded like you said, no, no idea whatsoever. So the guy kind of forgot about it for a bit and happened to be watching an episode of the TV show Supernatural. And there's a Wendigo episode there where they say it can mimic voices and they use mimicry in the episode. And he thought, well, maybe that's something that it was the Wendigo playing a trick on me. And that's one thing that we noticed that is a new invention as well, is that the old lore doesn't really talk about it mimicking any voices or trying to lure people out and trick them as maybe a trickster type character would where this thing just doesn't care. Its voice actually paralyzes you. If you hear its voice coming from the woods, it is said that you will stand still in fear and it will come and eat you as it uh, wants, that it doesn't try to trick, it doesn't try to maneuver its way around you. It simply just comes after you. So that's another, uh, I think, modern interpretation of it. 
much like many people have the misconception that it's nothing more than a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch that's turned murderous and is out hunting. And all the old literature, all the old lore, if you read the book, you'll see that it simply is not a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch, or at least in our belief, it's not that creature running around trying to consume people. Yeah, that is another thing I've noticed, too, is a lot of times you're looking up, you know, um, Bigfoot folklore and Wendigo comes up or vice versa. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting how it is kind of caught between several things that it isn't in the public eye. But I guess that brings up the question, what exactly is like, you know, if you're looking for the classic traditional Wendigo? Well, the Wendigo is is kind of a complicated thing because it's it's not just one thing, you know, like people, you know, if you're looking for lizard man, you know, it's it's pretty cut and dry what lizard man is. Or if you're looking for Sasquatch, you know, everyone knows what Sasquatch looks like with, you know, a few variations. But with the Wendigo, it's it's more of a process or a syndrome. And again, that's one of the things that we found difficult about the book when we were first writing it is you know, we were trying to do research on it, but we kept coming up with these these different images or different definitions of what a Wendigo is. So number one, we would come across a whole bunch of reports, especially in the actual lore, saying that the Wendigo is a spirit. It's a it's something it's a personification of hunger and cold and ice of, of the wintertime. And it's this sort of bleak and barren. Uh, negative spirit creature that can inhabit someone and, and possess them. Number two, we would come across reports of humans, basically people that had kind of gone crazy and went cannibal, or, or as they call it, going Wendigo, and had eaten family members, friends, people in their tribe, or even in uh, cases among white settlers too. And so we're like, okay, well, maybe this this is just a person that's gone cannibal, and this is just a regional name for that phenomena. But then there's also number three, something that's much more monstrous, which is more of like a Northwoods ogre that's that's very uh, thin and creepy, very cadaverous, and it also hunts people down and eats them. So as we wrote the book, we were at that kind of crossroads. We're like, well which of the three is this? And what we've figured out is that in fact, it's really all three and it's, but it's more of a process. So just like a, you know, Chad and I like to use this analogy, just like a caterpillar and a butterfly are very, very different in appearance. They're essentially different stages of the same organism. So the process that, that we believe according to the lore is that, the Wendigo spirit, which there's a great Wendigo spirit in a, a singular sense, like with a capital W, but it can also create sort of minor or Wendigo spirits, multiple that are kind of parts of itself. And when you get into the spirit world, it, it what's what's real and unreal, or you know the different rules apply. But a Wendigo spirit basically inhabits a person when they are spiritually weakened. You know if they're experiencing uh, starvation, or if they're under magical attack by a shaman, or something like that. Something that makes, basically punches a hole within their, their spiritual armor for it to attack them and attach itself to them. You know, much like uh, the Western concept of demonic possession. Once, once that Wendigo gets a hold of someone, it s- starts changing them. And that's when you go into phase two, where the, the unfortunate individual starts behaving very erratically strangely uh becomes withdrawn sometimes has manic episodes and they start having a craving for human flesh now sometimes this is brought on by starvation but in other cases it's not in in some cases there's plenty of food around but they don't want that they don't even notice that what they see is people around them that are starting to look like food and there's all kinds of reports where people will look at family members and 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 other members of the tribe and not see them as people. They'll see them as game food, like moose or beaver, things like that. 
And at this point, this is the stage where, where hopefully they can be cured. They can be cured by a shaman or a family member that, that knows how to treat this, this uh, syndrome or this possession, depending on, on how you approach it uh, from your own personal philosophy. And, but the time is, the clock is kind of ticking at this point because it's believed that once this person actually engages in eating human flesh, that the process is irreversible. And at that point, you enter stage three, which is where they physically turn, start turning into a monster. It's believed that the more human flesh they eat, the larger and more grotesque and dangerous they become. So at this point, you know, they would usually escape out into the wilderness and live like an animal and prey upon uh, hunters, travelers, or even uh, attack entire villages. Wow. You know, and it's interesting because you guys really did delve very deep into, you know, the belief structure of the Wendigo in the First Nations people. And, you know, I think that that is a point that you make very well, is that this is something that really can't be kind of taken out of that climate, that it is still very much, you know, relevant in that fashion. Yeah, no, I just think that, you know, not very many people really go and look at the origins of many of these legends, whether it is the Wendigo or even, you know, I feel like it extends to most other paranormal entities. A lot of people are more focused on strictly what it was, you know, what is the entity? What is the phenomenon? And they don't really look at the implications of that within a culture at a certain time. And you guys did, which is just really fantastic. I think that's partly why also it's very hard to put this down as a mental illness that when you're looking at a belief system, a way of life, a culture from 400 years ago that is so remote and so foreign to us today, that I think even today we have no idea how exactly this played out in those cultures that we don't know exactly. Kevin and I often talk about how much Wendigo lore we believe has been lost over the generations because nobody wrote it down or the oral tales were not told any longer. So we tried to get as far and deep into the legend as we could, but we really believe a lot of it was simply lost to history. Yeah, it is just, you know, it's amazing too, because for the people who do try and chalk it up to simply, you know, I think that probably the psychological angle, you know, that it's only psychosis is probably the one that takes the least amount of evidence into account. Um, because you guys point out, too, there's, you know, 300 years of records about the Wendigo for something that, you know, according to many people, doesn't exist. It has a huge effect. And, and that's, one of the, that's one of the issues that we notice quite a bit in our research. You know, it's, you know, it's almost like an academic version of mansplaining. You know, it's these people that, that weren't there and telling people or making a commentary about people that that they're wrong, that they know better. And, you know, and it's really disingenuous and it, and it it discredits entire cultures of people and their beliefs. You know, Matt and I are of much of the mind to take them at their word. You know, if they say that there's written accounts of this person acting this way and these events happened and they, a lot of them are described in, in very, very good detail. You know, why shouldn't we just take them at their word? You know, they were there, they saw what happened, they wrote it down, but instead, because, you know, they were first nation or native American that, Oh, they couldn't have possibly have understood what was actually happening. Or, you know, they, they're, they're all just superstitious. And, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. You see a lot of that. It's getting better in academia, I think, but, you know, Chad and I had to go back through many, many decades of 20th century research, especially. And you, you can just see a lot of the, the bias that's, you know, pretty much everywhere. So we had to look at everything with a really keen eye and filter a lot of that out. And another thing that we found quite a bit with academics and scholars looking at this is most of them believe that the Wendigo was simply created to explain away or give some comfort and solace to those who were merely looking to get rid of their sick, their old, their feeble, 
and that they could kill them by saying that person was turning into a Wendigo. We have to kill them to stop them from infecting the entire tribe or the village or wherever it was, and that this would be a way to cleanse their conscience of killing their own family members. And it gave them an excuse to get rid of those who might be taking up too much food in dire circumstances. And what we found is that many, many, many of the cases simply contradict that, that not only were some of these people that were killed for being an alleged Wendigo, uh, the you know hunters and gatherers and very important people in their family structure and in the larger community structure, but oftentimes they were tried to be uh, saved, that the family members, the tribes, the villagers, they often went out of their way for weeks on end to try to save this person before finally, after being so terrified and having no other uh, means of helping this person, they finally did kill them. But it wasn't their first resort. In fact, it was their last resort. It's interesting, too, because in going through this, I was especially intrigued by a lot of the trials that you guys um, dug up um, regarding people who you know, were taken into custody and tried for killing a would-be Wendigo. You know, how prevalent was that? Was that happening like a lot at that time? It, it was, uh, unfortunately, um, in the research that Chad and I did, you know, we uncovered literally hundreds of cases of either people being uh, eaten by, by other people that had gone Wendigo or Wendigos themselves being uh, executed by Wendigo hunters or, or at trial. And so, you know, when we first started writing this book, we, we, we knew that there was some actual cases. I mean, we knew that going in. But we really had no idea of just how widespread this was in the, uh, eight, especially in the 18th and 19th century. You know, we we knew we thought maybe there was a handful, you know, or or just more legend, you know, but not well documented, perhaps. But in reality, literally hundreds of and hundreds of people died as a result of this, which, you know, really made this book a lot different because when we normally write books on folklore, you know, yet. It's something about, you know, a, a cool monster or entity or something strange out in the woods. But, you know, rarely do they involve, you know, actual murders and executions. So this this kind of took the book to a whole different level and gave it a lot more gravity and, and somberness because, you know, real people died. You know, it's not something that you can just be like, oh, this is just another fun monster tale. You know, there's really nothing about about the Wendigo story. And many of those that were responsible for the killing of the Wendigo, a lot of the time it uh, would be done by a family member to stop anybody from retaliating if they think thought it was a, a bad killing. But also when the, the white police uh, came to arrest some of these First Nation and Native peoples for what they believed to be murder, a lot of them went willingly with the officers because they believed they had done nothing wrong. In fact, they believed they were doing their duty to protect their loved ones by killing this person. And they thought, there's no way we're going to get in trouble for this. So they willingly went into the town and went to trial. And oftentimes they were found guilty. Sometimes they were given a slap on the wrist because it was seen that this was their way of life. Many of them were so remote that some of them had never even seen a white person before. And this was their way of life. And they often would say, well, we don't let our animals suffer. We put them out of their misery. Why would we let our loved ones suffer by turning into a Wendigo? There are no hospitals. There are no medical facilities. They had no other choice. And they were simply terrified. Let me give you, uh, Zelia, a quick story of how terrified they were of the Wendigo and just how much precaution they took in killing it. So there was a case up in northern Alberta in Canada in the late 1800, and it talks about a man who was going uh, Wendigo, turning Wendigo. So his family members and friends tried to cure him, and eventually he just kept saying, I'm going to consume you, I'm going to eat you, I'm going to kill all of you. They would tie him down 
he would escape. He'd start to grunt at them and yell and scream like an animal. So eventually they could take it no longer and they grabbed several axes and smashed him in the chest and killed him. But they sat there around the body believing that it was going to rise up because it was a Wendigo. It would simply come back to life and come after them again. So eventually that evening they drove a stake through one of the axe holes in his chest, pinned him to the ground. And then they let him sit there for a while. And then they pulled out the steak and poured hot tea into his wound to melt his icy heart, which is a uh, telltale sign of the Wendigo having uh, ice encased around its heart. So they poured this hot tea into the wound to thaw the ice to make sure he couldn't come back. But that wasn't enough for them. They then tied his legs with chains and staked him to the ground again. Eventually, as daybreak was coming, they were so terrified that they hadn't done enough to kill him that they decapitated him just to make sure he was dead. This is the kind of fear that the Wendigo elicited. Well, I know, too, you talk about how whole um, settlements would sometimes be vacated if you know there was a belief that the Wendigo was coming. I mean, again, this is something that really caused it caused an effect on people. Um, you know, and I think that to say that, well, nothing caused it, it was just, you know, psychosis or whatever, or it was simply a belief, it really doesn't take into account the evidence for these extreme measures. And I would like to remind everyone that you are listening to Just Another Tinfoil Hat, copyrighted on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm your host, Azealia Edgar, and we are visiting with Kevin Lee Nelson and Chad Lewis. It, it was a, a very dead serious phenomena, especially in the, the 17 and 1800s. You know, if if word got out that a Wendigo was within a district or an, or an area, people, especially First Nations people, would just vacate that entire region. And it was such a problem that even the Hudson Bay Company had to deal with it because, you know, a lot of these these native trappers would supply them with furs. And if if they were completely, you know, run out of an entire area, that was a whole region where they weren't getting furs from. So. You know, other than just the, the safety issue or the fear, you know, there was a very economic issue going on here, too, just because of how widespread it was. Yeah, we even have cases, several cases of people that heard a Wendigo was in the area. They hadn't seen it. They hadn't heard it. It was merely talk that the Wendigo was in the area. They refused to get out of their lodging to go hunting or gathering food so much that several people starve to death rather than to get out and go hunting or gathering because the Wendigo was merely suggested to be in the area. Again, it's just incredible the fear that was surrounding this creature to the point of people would rather starve to death than to risk going out and encountering one of these beings. Wow. I mean, because I know, too, throughout the book, it's kind of brought up that this was a fear even greater than death. You know, this fear of this entity or turning into one. It, it was because, you know, there was sort of a almost a spiritual fear involved here because people believe that if they went Wendigo, it was a spiritual contagion. You know, so not only was it affecting their physical body, but it was also affecting their their spirit you know, the, the eternal part of themselves. So, you know, from a, from a Western point of view, you know, it's similar to like, you know, being damned, you know, it's like our view towards vampires, for instance, you know, European legends, you know, if you, if you become a vampire, a lot of, of the folklore is that your, your soul is now damned, you know, that you cannot go to heaven because you're, you've become a vampire. And that the only way to release your soul, you know, is a stake through the heart and, and utterly destroying it. So it's, it's in some ways, there's, there's some similarities to that. You know, it's this fear of destroying, you know, in the, the most basic essence of yourself. And the idea that it was more terrifying than death itself is illustrated quite a bit in a lot of the cases where people who were turning Wendigo or going Wendigo. They actually begged their loved ones and family to kill them before they turned Wendigo because they did not want to be responsible for turning into a cannibal and hunting their loved ones. So they actually begged to be killed 
rather than turn into the Wendigo, again, illustrating that the Wendigo was more fearful than death. You know, and there was a part in the book, too, um, you just brought up vampires, where you guys discussed the um, undead issue. And that was really, that was interesting to read because there is, I feel like the lines in so many cases with supernatural entities are very blurred. And the issue of what is undead is actually one of those areas that is a huge gray area. You know, and so that debate was actually really, really neat to read. Thanks. Yeah, like, you know, when I was doing research on this, one of the, as Chad brought up, one of the traits of a Wendigo is that its heart is frozen in ice, you know, and, and sometimes even when they kill these things and, and open them up, they discover that ice has formed along the backbone. And, and ice is this, this characteristic that is just linked to, to Wendigo in, in nearly every tradition. They're just white, uh, Wendigo and ice, Wendigo in winter. It, they're part, you know, they're basically just linked together. So I was thinking, you know, unlike a normal cryptid where it's just an, a, a strange animal, you know, like some people think Bigfoot is, things like that, or Chupacabra, that it's just a strange animal, but it still has normal uh, biology, normal physiology. But this creature, according to legend, you know, its heart is frozen solid. You know, it doesn't have an active pulmonary system. So technically this creature isn't even alive by the way that we normally define life. So then what is it? You know, it's basically this this Northwoods frozen ghoul, for lack of a better term, that devours human beings. And so I started contrasting it with, you know, the European concept of the undead and it seems to fall in line with that. I mean, I know that we're comparing two very different traditions, but just for the sake of comparison, you know, I, I compare and contrast just how Europeans define the undead and, and where the Wendigo, you know, would fit within that definition. Yeah. Would you guys say, you know, is this something that is almost found in every culture, this idea of some sort of entity, entity that is kind of in that in-between, like, undead state that comes back to devour the living. Is that kind of a constant across most cultures? It, it seems to be. I mean, you, you see worldwide all kinds of stories of, of what they call hungry ghosts. That's a, it's a very, very worldwide tradition. And typically, the first thing that they do is attack family members. And whether that's because they're the closest nearby or or there's some kind of uh, reason to, you know, envy, or maybe one, maybe they were maligned, you know, while they were living, you know, and there's, so there's a revenge factor, you know, that might be why they actually go after people that they knew. But you see that all over the world, this, this concept of these hungry ghosts that, that devour uh, energy from the living, or, I mean, even, even in vampire lore, when you go back to the, the old vampire lore, like the Transylvanian and uh, Eastern European lore, almost always the first people that they attack are their own family members. They're usually the first to go or the first to be turned into vampires. And so, you know, whether it's devouring energy or health or physically draining blood, you know, there, there just is this concept of beings that, that now no, that no longer have a physical body per se or in a limited capacity, just have this, this lust for spiritual energy or lust for being alive again, because they no longer are. You know, like you said, a lot of people will try to define these things as like, okay, it's just some weird animal out there then. Um, but again, that seems to be another worldwide concept where there's, there are these things that almost exist kind of on the border between material and immaterial. You know, and I feel like the Wendigo, um, it definitely does kind of capture that edge because it can cause physical effects, you know, obviously, while at the same time kind of remaining in that sort of very supernatural kind of realm. I mean, is that kind of a fair estimation of it? I think it is. Um, it seems to have more supernatural capabilities. It can get as large as it wants. Many uh, witnesses claim that it was larger than the treetops. 
It seems to be impervious to weather, of course. It can swim underwater without needing to breathe. It can shapeshift. Some believe it can even shapeshift into various animals and try to trick you. There were a lot of stories of uh, villages fearing black dogs coming in because they believed it was the Wendigo uh, shapeshifting coming in to spy on them. The same with owls. They believed owls were either Wendigos or spies for the Wendigos that would come in. So you had the shape-shifting aspect. You had the ability to get large or as small as you wanted. You had the ability to paralyze people with your voice. All kinds of things that we don't associate with flesh and blood type creatures. You know, again, back to many who believe in Bigfoot or Sasquatch believe that they're flesh and blood. Some unidentified animal that we just haven't discovered yet where the Wendigo seems to be in a much different category and perhaps a category all of its own. Oh yeah. You know, and another thing that um, came up a few times was um, its proximity to anomalous light phenomena. Um, Is that kind of a more recent invention or is that something that's been associated with it for a very long time? Well, it has, at least in northern Minnesota, there's a lot of reports of this thing being accompanied by a ball of light. Back in the 1880s, a pioneer that lived in the Roseau area in a place called Indian Village, because there were several hundred native peoples living there and some white pioneer families, this pioneer by the name of Jake Nelson kept a very detailed journal about his life in the Roseau Valley. And in it, he talks about mysterious balls of light that would Uh, come through the village. They called it the willow of the wisp back then. These lights that would dart about, disappear, and then reappear somewhere in the community within a few seconds. Many claim that they would leave it alone because it was too much like, you know, tempting the devil trying to capture these things. And the Wendigo also appeared several times in the Roseau area. And uh, on several occasions, it had this ball of light that would accompany it. So many people in northern Minnesota equate the Wendigo with these odd, mysterious, anomalous light that seem to be. But the other accounts, you know, there's nowhere to be found, or at least it wasn't talked about or it wasn't recorded. It could have been happening, but we have no indication because it wasn't recorded. And we found that very disheartening as well, that even reports in the 1920s and 30s that made newspaper articles. When they talked about the Wendigo, they left out all the details. No skin color. No, if it was furry. Uh, Once in a while, they'd say it had fur running down its back like a rabbit fur on its back. But all the details were missing as though they were pressed for space or something. Huh. Yeah, that's that's intriguing. I mean, you know, too, northern Minnesota. um, I think you guys mentioned that that's a place where there are still... Um, beliefs about the Wendigo currently. Is that pretty widespread throughout the Great Lakes region? Like, are there still, you know, even barring any sightings, which I um, would like to get to in a second, are there still, you know, is there still that folkloric aspect where people actually do carry on beliefs that the Wendigo exists? Yeah, it, it seems to be pretty widespread throughout the Great Lakes. And, and What we discovered was that there's slight variations in what those beliefs are based on region. So in the Great Lakes area, and especially northern Minnesota, the the Wendigo tradition is a little bit different in the sense that Wendigos are seen as this this bad omen, sort of a harbinger of death. So when you see them, it means that someone nearby or someone in the vicinity will die soon. So you know, even if they're not actively attacking people or eating people, just the, the mere sight of one usually uh, means tragedy, and that's that's a little bit unique to just that region. Sort of like I said, northern Minnesota, Lake of the Woods, you know, up that Canadian border area up in there. Um, they also have a belief that uh, snowmen. You, you have to be careful making snowmen because if if you build a snowman, there's a chance that a Wendigo spirit could inhabit it just like it could a person, which is kind of interesting. You know, it's that, again, that whole link to uh, snow and ice and you're creating this human or man-like figure that it can inhabit, which 
kind of gets almost to the the Jewish tradition of creating a golem, you know, this sort of crafted image or effigy that that a spirit can inhabit and move around. And a, a similar analogy, too, is also among the Pennsylvania Dutch who believe that if you don't burn a scarecrow by Halloween, that evil spirits can inhabit them and bring them to life. Man, that is so neat. So um, speaking of current you know, beliefs, I know that, too, in the book, um, you mentioned that there are current sightings of kind of the more traditional Wendigo, you know, the non-antlered version. So, again, is that something that is fairly prevalent to this day? I think so. And not only the sightings, which I'll, I'll get to a recent one here, but also the belief of merely mentioning the name of the monster is a thought to be enough to bring it on you. That if you say the name of the Wendigo, it will pick you up on some sort of supernatural beacon or radar, and it will come after you. It will be aware of your presence. So we found traveling uh, all through the U.S. and Canada that there were many people who did not like saying the name of the creature. In fact, I was presenting a lecture on Minnesota's most mysterious creatures up in the uh, Bemidji area by Cass Lake, which is where Lake Windigo is. And before the program, I had some elders from the local tribe come up to me and say, I heard you're going to be talking about one of our local creatures. We would uh, like to ask you if you would not talk about it during this presentation. And of course, I knew right away they were talking about the Wendigo, but they wouldn't say it. They just wow. said a local legend that we would rather you not speak about. So I told them that I would not talk about it during the program. And immediately on their faces, you could just see the sense of relief and their body language shifted and they were no longer tense and worried that they were relaxed just because I wasn't going to mention it. Wow. So not only do you have people still seeing it, but you still have some segments that refuse to even talk about it, lest it comes back and comes after you. And that is, see, that's just amazing. Because again, you know, I'm very interested in the belief structures around unexplained phenomena. And to see that something which I think most people think of as, well, that's just, you know, a legend that's from the past, you know, the belief kind of died out there. You know, to see that it still has that much sway is really, really amazing. And the sightings continue to come in. Uh, a couple years ago, two young teenage boys were at a summer camp. They were brothers in the north woods of Spooner, Wisconsin, which is in the northern section of the state. And last year, I spoke with them, interviewed them on the site of this old historic summer camp. And on several uh, separate nights, both brothers uh, separately spotted some weird creature lurking about very tall, very pale, very thin. And they got a sense immediately that it was evil, that it was there to harm them. They had no idea what it was. It was only a brief sighting on each evening, but they notified the camp counselors and the camp counselors took it very seriously. They went around making sure that nothing was out of uh, the ordinary because they didn't know if it was a deranged human, a predator, a bear, or something else in the woods. So they took it very seriously and they implemented a policy that if any of the campers were going to go out at night, that they had to have a partner with them. They would go in pairs for safety. And these brothers had no idea what they had seen. So they went home after camp and started Googling. And when they got to the images of uh, Wendigo, they said that's exactly what they spotted, the traditional image of the Wendigo. But until then, they had no idea. It wasn't as though they had been reading a book or watching a movie on it, and then they saw it and said, oh, that must be a Wendigo. But just by what they felt and saw, they believed it was a Wendigo. And this was only a couple years ago. So these cases are continuing, certainly nowhere near the prevalence that they were 100 or 200 years ago, but they simply do happen still. And, and that's that's one of the goals of our book, too, is to kind of clarify really what what a Wendigo is and but also at least what it what it isn't, at least for now. Um, you know, the thing about folklore and legends is they're fluid. You know, they change over time. I mean, the, the 
the image of a Wendigo from the 1700s compared to today you know, is a great illustration of that, how you know these legends can change over time. But we wanted to give us sort of a snapshot in time of where it exists right now. You know, like during our research, you know, we were contacted by a, a few people that because of the, the ambiguity on what a Wendigo really is, you know, we were getting all kinds of, of reports of just strange things that people were calling Wendigo, but this didn't really fit. Uh, for example, I interviewed a woman in North Carolina, which is far, far from, from Wendigo country. And she claimed that, that she had or knew of experiences in the North Carolina woods of, uh, of seeing or, or at least uh, signs of a Wendigo, a Wendigo being in this this wooded part of North Carolina. And, and I know that it sometimes snows in North Carolina, but certainly not like the Great Lakes and, and certainly not like Canada. These, these creatures, according to legend, kind of move with the, the snow belt, you know, as it, as it moves down in wintertime and then recedes in the spring. And, and, I was, and I, so I was kind of curious, you know, like, wow, a Wendigo sighting in North Carolina? You know, that's a little odd. So I kind of prodded her a bit more for details and discovered that kind of what she was describing, at least from the phenomena and, and the, the glimpses that she and other people had seen of it, it seemed to fit more of a category of a creature that's more of an uh, Appalachian legend of a creature called a behinder, or also mm-hmm. called a hide behind, which is sort of this spooky uh, forest creature that is always hiding behind trees. And it's always, it's always behind you waiting to pounce kind of thing. But as soon as you as soon as you look back, it, it moves back behind a tree. And so it sounded a lot more like that legend. But, but since he knew the Wendigo term, but didn't quite understand the, the lore associated with it, she was using the term Wendigo to describe this other phenomenon. You know, I feel like the Wendigo, as I mentioned previously, is really kind of hitting the modern consciousness um, recently. And do you think that will have an effect? You know, I feel like a lot of researchers discuss how, you know, awareness of a certain entity or occurrence brings in a surge of reports, whether that has to do with the fact that then it's more accepted, so witnesses are likely to report it, or if it suggests some sort of interface with human consciousness, I don't really know. Do you think that this revived interest in the Wendigo, is that bringing in more reports of the Wendigo? Or like you even mentioned, more reports where people think they saw it and were mistaken? Well, I, I certainly think it will. I mean, as as it grows in pop culture, I mean, you're seeing it, the Wendigo appear in video games now. I mean, obviously, it's been in, in comic books for a, a, a few decades. And it's it's starting to kind of percolate up into the, the consciousness of regular people. You know, they're, they're coming across this term more and more. You know, it's Stephen King uses it in Pet Cemetery. There's a there's a new movie coming out called Antlers, uh, a new horror film that it was supposed to be out in April, but it was delayed because of COVID. We don't know when it's coming out now, mm. but it's supposed to be a Wendigo film. And so I, I think that the more people hear this term, that you're going to have more and more reports, you know, whether they're accurate or not, who knows? But, you know, I, I think that as that term becomes normalized, it's just going to grow and grow. And our hope with this book is is that you know the people that read it will have a better understanding of the the folklore in general, so that when something strange does happen, they'll know whether it was or it wasn't. Yeah, that's. I mean, because I do. I really feel like the Wendigo is something that for a long time it was always kind of you know almost lurking in the background of pop culture. Now it is really you know making a huge breakthrough with that. Um, and again, the actual way it's portrayed can vary quite a bit. Um, but speaking of video games, Chad, um, I know that you actually were involved with one regarding the Wendigo. Yes, there a few years back, a video game called Until Dawn came out, and it involves um, some explorers or campers being trapped on a mountain and being hunted by the Wendigo, and you had to survive. And if people beat the game, one of the bonus options that popped up was an interview I had done on Swift Runner, which is a gentleman who was thought to have turned Wendigo back in the 1800s and murdered and consumed his entire family. 
So as a, a bonus option or as a, I guess, a little reward, if you will, for beating the game, uh, I pop up as an interview in that. And I think it illustrates that, yes, more people are becoming aware of the Windigo as more and more pop culture and mass media cover it. But I think we also have to be wary of now many people seeing things like Kevin alluded to earlier of it becoming a catch all from everything from spirits to unknown cryptids to just hauntings that they might give it a name. And I think we have to be very careful going forward and looking at these cases so we just don't lump them all together as the Wendigo. Yeah, you actually you brought up a very interesting point, too. Um, kind of regarding more the catch-all of Wendigo psychosis. Um, and that was how some people try to tie um, even more current serial killers or even that um, really tragic Greyhound bus killing um, from, I think, gosh, was that 2012, um, in with Wendigo psychosis. And you guys um, actually brought that up in the book, um, how it really doesn't fit that model. Which, again, there are, there's just so many misconceptions about this that I was I was actually very glad to see that because I do feel like this could become yet another, you know, catch all for a wide variety of things, whether it's entities or um even horrific crimes. I think Yeah. Oh, oh go, go ahead, ahead, Kevin. Jeff. I was just gonna say, uh, you know, with that that horrific Greyhound bus case in, in Canada, you know, it's one of those just weird situations. It, it's a it's a very, very unusual event. You know, basically you you had this mentally disturbed man on the bus attack another passenger and murder him and and even devour him partly and so because it took place in canada people were and because it involved cannibalism people were pointing to it and saying oh my gosh this is this is a modern day uh wendigo report you know this is this is a wendigo because it you know the the region fit and the cannibalism but chad and i both both agree you know we looked at this and we're like you know, this really doesn't fit the traditional pattern at all, because this person was was mentally disturbed. There was no uh, starvation involved. There was no uh, prolonged psychosis of him being withdrawn or anything. It was it was very on, uh, sudden onset with this individual, and all of the pattern just didn't really fit at all. And he, when he, once he was arrested, he claimed that the reason that he attacked the other person was because he believed that they were a uh, an alien come to 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 attack humanity. You know, so he wasn't really looking at him as food. He was he was looking at him as this invader. So it it was just a whole whole different situation, and people were jumping to a lot of conclusions early on. And you know, one of the the analogies that I give or examples I give in the book is, you know, Chad and I both live in Wisconsin, which of course is the home of, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer and Ed Gein and, you know, like horrible, you know, mass or serial killers that at least in uh, Gein's case, you know, he, they say he, he ate some of his victims and there's good evidence that Dahmer may have done the same, but no one ever points to either one of them and, and calls them a Wendigo. You know, they, it just, the pattern just doesn't really fit. Yeah, I know. I was I was really interested um, to see that because, yeah, I remember actually when um, the Greyhound bus thing happened and I did see it on several websites being pointed to as Wendigo psychosis. And to see then that the guy actually believed in, um, you know, an alien invasion, it is just a whole different can of worms. I think they were trying to really force that in. And again, Canada being the location of the crime played a lot in the role. And also the gruesomeness of it, of decapitating the gentleman and walking around the Greyhound bus, carrying the head like it was some type of severed trophy. So I think if it would have happened, I mean, nobody accuses people down in Florida that are, have gone crazy on bath salts and commit cannibalism as being a Wendigo. So it was obviously the location of uh, being in Canada that gave it that Wendigo. But we're going to find those quite a bit, I think, coming forward in the next decade or two. We're going to find a lot of accounts that get blamed on the Wendigo that on further evidence probably shouldn't be there. And, and just to kind of piggyback on that, too, you know, as far as, you know, the quote unquote authenticity of sightings, you know, there are separate uh there is separate folklore for things that are 
for lack of a better term, called deer men, you know, where people see these these humanoid uh, figures that have uh, deer features. You know, they might have the head of a deer with antlers, or they could even be, you know, from the bottom down deer. You know, it's there's various uh, variations on that. But, you know, again, some people are like, well, well is this a Wendigo? Because it has antlers, it has a, it has a deer head, and it's man-like. But, you know, there's a there's a, a famous deer man case in northern Illinois that they just call it deer man. You know, it doesn't eat people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. anything, it just kind of spooks people. So, you know, it's 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 easy to kind of conflate the two the two legends based on description when when really they're they're two separate things. You know, as we're coming up on the hour here in the book a little bit, you kind of discussed, you know, the relevance relevance of almost the Wendigo archetype in modern culture. I guess just, you know, to finish out the show today, where do you kind of see that going? You know, the Wendigo either as an archetype or even the sightings, you know, where do you think the research into this lore is going to go or the lore itself, I guess? Well, I can, I can tackle that question. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great question because we really just don't know where this can go. I mean, that's, that's kind of the beauty of folklore is, you know, how they evolve in, in very unpredictable ways. You know, for instance, if this, this whole deer man imagery sticks around for another 100 or 200 years, then does that mean that that is the official Wendigo lore? You know, just, be, just because of time? You know, the, you know, so it's like, how do, you, how do you assess these things and what's legitimate or what's original or not? I mean, clearly... We can point to the origins of what of how the the legend originated, but you know if something's been a, a certain way for two three hundred years, then it's kind of become normalized where that is part of the lore. So, but as far as you know these things being symbolic, um, you know one of the points that we bring up in the book is you know how Wendigos are seen as these creatures that symbolize uh, greed. You know, they're they're always hungry, they're always eating, and they can never be full. And so, a lot of writers have used the Wendigo as a, a symbol of things like capitalism or Western expansion. You know, basically, this whole appetite that people have, this materialistic appetite to just ha need more and more and more. And, you know, enough is never enough. So it's, you know, people have compared it to almost this, this North American ethos of, you know, just devouring everything in sight and seeing, seeing our world and our environment as something to be consumed and exploited, so, which is what the Wendigo does. So, you know, it, other than being like, you know, just this kind of spooky uh, Northwoods boogeyman, it, it does have a lot of ability to become something more in, in the sense of a symbolic representation of the human psyche. Yeah, I feel like that, you know, that kind of is relevant for a lot of paranormal entities. And you know, I can definitely see the connections there with um, the Wendigo. So Chad, any parting thoughts before we sign off for the day? Well, I think this is a, a fascinating creature. It may be one of the oldest creatures in North America. And it's one of the least known creatures in North America. So it's very ironic. But I, I think out of all the research that I've done in the last 25 years, I think uh, nothing is going to stand out as much as this Wendigo creature research. And I think Kevin and I both feel that this thing is uh, very, maybe the most puzzling, bizarre, and baffling folklore piece that we've ever encountered. And I'm excited to see what happens as we go forward, as more and more people contact us with their stories or forgotten history. So even after maybe 400 plus years, I really feel this is the beginning of the Wendigo. Yeah, I mean, seriously, you know, the book is just is fantastic. And I feel like it is really it is kind of a revival of what actually what is this phenomenon, as opposed to, you know, kind of the same tired theories over and over again that just try to dismiss it. Um, this really is kind of bringing it back to life, so to speak, in my opinion. So before we sign off then, um, if you guys could direct uh, the listeners to your websites, anything coming up that you're excited about? Well, you can get our book at 
backroadslore.com. That's uh, probably one of the easiest places to get it. Uh, we ship free within the continental United States. And if, if you want a signed copy, that's the best place to get it. And of course, we're, we're available at all the, the usual online booksellers as well. Nice. Well, seriously, you know, thank you guys so much, not only for appearing on the show, but also for writing this book. Um, it is, it seriously is just probably the most in-depth look at this expansive phenomena of the Wendigo that exists as far as, you know, I've read. So again, Wendigo lore, monsters, myths, and madness. Fantastic read, highly recommended to everyone out there. So thanks again for being on the show today, guys. Thanks for having us. Keep an eye out. Now, once again, I would really like to thank my guests, Chad Lewis and Kevin Lee Nelson, for a really fantastic conversation tonight. I would also like to thank Irene Allen Block and Mark Johnson, the people in charge here at the Paranormal UK Radio Network. And a thank you, too, to John Hutchinson for composing my intro and outro music. With all that said, if you enjoyed this program, you can catch new episodes every other Monday on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. And go ahead and check out my YouTube channel, also called Just Another Tinfoil Hat. Again, this has been Just Another Tinfoil Hat, copyrighted on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. And I am Zelia Edgar, signing off.